Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're located. My name is Nate Nisidora, and on behalf of Philips Leiden University, I would like to thank you for attending. Today, we have the pleasure of introducing our webinar called Iconic Towers. We have two very knowledgeable speakers ready to give you an inspirational presentation today. Our first speaker is Gavin Cooper, Vice President and Partner at LED Source in Wellington, Florida. Gavin has over 12 years of experience with LED lighting and headed the team for Miami Tower's turnkey lighting project. Our second presenter today is Justin Rawlings from Philips Color Kinetic. With 10 years of lighting experience under his belt, Justin led the team responsible for lighting applications of the Empire State Building. Now that I have your attention, I would like to direct it towards the right side of the screen, where you can see the chat box and the Q&A box, question and answer box. If you're facing any technical issues, please state so in the chat box, and our representative will try to help you as swiftly as possible. And if you have any questions for the presenters, please state so in the Q&A box. And at the end of the presentation, the presenters will try to answer as many of your questions as possible. Now, without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to hand it over to Gavin Cooper. Thank you, Nathan. And also thank you to uh, Phillips for inviting me to talk about the uh, Miami Tower project. Um, so, Miami Tower, um, obviously we're gonna go through a few topics, which is the design, uh, construction, um, the conventional lighting that was already used and why we chose LED, uh, the mock-up process that we used to, to show ownership that um, the LED lighting would work, the challenges that we had doing that, and obviously the results that um, came from the entire project. So Miami Tower, um, a very iconic building in the Miami downtown skyline. Um, it was a 625 foot tall building, very, very tall. Um, the architect um, was actually Ian Pei, who was also famous for doing the, uh, the pyramid structure at the Louvre in Paris, and definitely designed this building to be illuminated. Um, the building opens in 87, but was lit um, late in 86 to, to promote the building itself. So it's been lighting on the building since 1986. Um, we got together with Jans Lang Lassell, which is uh, the management company, to, to see how we could upgrade the lighting itself um, because of the aging fixtures they had and other concerns, obviously one of them being energy consumption. So to that point on energy consumption, they had 1,000 watt metal halide fixtures. Um, as you can see from the picture there, they, they had to um, rent roof spaces from property owners across the street from the building to light um, the north, northwest and uh, west elevations of the building. And you can see from that, they also had to use a gel if they wanted to project color onto the building. So that obviously presented a lot of problems for them. Also, they're very unsightly on the building. So as you can see from there, tenants in the building um, could look out the windows and look into these huge fixtures. Um, and then with that, they added gels on the front that were very unsightly and caused a lot of complaints to management about the lighting on the building. Everybody liked to see it light up, but not everybody liked to see the lights themselves. So part of the project was to, uh, to hide the fixtures as well as we could so they weren't visible from any of the um, perspective of the clients using the offices that are in that building. So to the mock-up, um, what we had to do was obviously uh, complete a 3D model of the building um, so that we could render all the fixtures onto it and show, show the team exactly what the, the system was capable of doing. And that was part of a, a complete video we put together of the package. Um, we also had to put in obviously budget, um, total costs, and there was also an ROI attached to that. So you know, how long would this whole project pay for itself in energy savings and changing gels? Um, 
and that that all worked in to the ROI. And part of that, going back to the previous slide, um, the the rental for those buildings alone was over a hundred thousand dollars a year. So that all worked into the overall cost and the overall return on their investment for, for changing the lights. And obviously, you know, reinventing the lighting scheme totally was 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 obviously part of it, but it had to pay for itself also. So moving on to the real mock-up, that's myself standing on top of a large um, scissor lift, painter's lift, whatever you'd like to call it. Um, you know, we had to prove after we'd done all the IS files and videos that yeah, it really would work. So we met with the um, energy and sustainability services guys, which was headed up by Bob Best and Larry Lubeck from JLL. This was done on an evening in Miami at the building. And um, we wanted to prove that it, it would answer a few of their questions, which were, would it be bright enough and would it reach the top of the building? So this test was done on the west side of the building. And from that, we answered the questions that they had. Yes, it did hit the top. Yes, it was going to be bright enough. So we used basically eight fixtures, which was going to be a third of what should have been designed in. So. As you can see from that, um, on the left-hand side was the original metal halide system. Uh, on that evening, it was set up for a film shoot, so we had to match the color, um, just in case the film crew came by. <laughs> and you can see from that that we were actually more intense. Um, that side of the building was actually using 69 metal halide fixtures to light that section. And Showing you there, that's only eight fixtures with uh, the anticipated 24 that we're going to be used. Then on to the south side, which is basically we call the setbacks. Um, obviously, so as they go up in, in um, sections of floor level, the building itself is set back with um, with a walkway around it, so it adds a bit of extra shape to that. Um, Following on from a previous slide where you can see the large fixtures that were on this um, 13th floor, um, you can see how much we've lowered them and they're now not visible from the window itself. They're very difficult to see, to view that from there. It also shows part of the architecture of the building that helps to illuminate it. As you can see on there, there's two half round bull noses that are a top and bottom of the, the flat panel, which is around two feet high. And that allows us to catch light all the way to the top of the building. And you'll see, um, when we go back up to the top floor, the 45th floor, which we used a slightly different fix before. And the idea of that is to, to create an even brighter halo or a crown around that back side on the, on the south side of the building. So. We used a linear fixture for that, and that created a, an even higher uh, brightness, higher luminance at the top of the building if it was required. So, so it really stood out. So it, it actually points out across the, the, the bay, across the water, and you can see this from the South Beach. So it's uh, a very prominent thing to see from there. On to uh, taking the, the fixtures away from the buildings to save, obviously, when the gel changes were done, uh, maintenance, uh, they had to have access to somebody else's roof. Um, so, and to save all that and the expense of obviously uh, renting those spaces, we had to design a way to get them off there and basically onto the, the property of the building. What we did was, um, as you can see, dug very large, deep holes, 10 feet deep, and placed in custom-made concrete uh, poles with a custom-made bracket on the top to hold the fixtures. There's actually 14 of those poles, and depending on the positioning of the poles, there's either four or six fixtures on top of each one, which basically on those three facets adds up to 72 types of fixtures. So not only would Doing lighting and lighting design, we're also having to obviously do some construction, as you see there. You know, large cranes, large poles, deep holes, and all the problems that that comes with. Um, dealing with the city, 
um, did on the construction, planning, everything else, um, was was the longest portion of the job to, to accomplish. Um, the, the rear side of the building was actually done in five weeks and to get to the stage of putting poles in the ground was another five months going through various stages with, uh, with planning and, and approvals. So obviously that was a very large part of the job, um, but a necessary thing to do because we had to get the lights off of the, of the surrounding rooftops. So to the results, as you can see um, from that, the, the, the multi facets, the setbacks, the flat sides, all give different views of, and basically how we can create different effects on the building itself. Each fixture has two addresses, so it can be run at, on a top section and a bottom section. So it's, it's technically two fixtures in, in one, so we can create chasing effects, Obviously, very slow because it's architectural. There are, there are some fast programs in there for New Year's Eve. Um, but overall, it's designed as an architectural design. So we, we run them at a, a fairly, fairly relatively slow pace. And this shot's taken from the other side of the Miami River across. So it obviously gives you the, the west and the south side. And you'll see. Um, the two different effects we can run at the same time. So we can have three three different flat sides and three different uh, rounded sides plus a different color on the crown or a multitude of, of designs and chasing them around the whole building. So as you can see from that, we can um, make movement on the building. So we can make a static fixture look like it's actually moving. And that was that was part of the design that the ownership and everybody else was really excited about. Before their color change was static, they had to change gels, it was manual. Um, and they were doing it around about six times a month. And obviously that involves three to four people pretty much all day to go change out 350 gels on the fixtures on and around the building. Now it can all be achieved by the push of the book. And then lastly, this is um, part of the design which, which shows on the back of the building, we use the same amount of fixtures on each floor on the south side um, so that we could have straight lines on the back of the building. So with different lending options, what we could achieve is uh, the same amount of fixtures on a longer or shorter radius on the back but with a taller throw. So we uh, we, did, we went through the design and it was, it was decided that 32 fixtures was the perfect amount. So each one of those floors has 32 fi individual fixtures on and then you have the, the crown as you see there with the uh, linear fixtures on. And this, um, this was done for September 11th to commemorate obviously 9-11 and um, one of my favorite shots, one of my favorite all time things on the building is, is this design. And um, I've actually got a very large one of these outside my office. So. <laughs> okay, and um, that basically concludes what um, I have to talk about on the building. Um, and I would uh, like to hand over back to, to Nathan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gavin. Gavin Cooper, ladies and gentlemen. And now I'd like to hand it over to Justin Rawlings. Justin. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Gavin. For the second half of the presentation, we're going to talk about the Empire State Building. My name is Justin, as Nathan mentioned. I'm the manager of applications engineering here at Phillips Color Kinetics. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer by trade. I joined uh, Color Kinetics back in 2005, and since then have worked on a number of high-profile LED lighting applications, Phosphorus Bridge, London Eye, CN Tower, and name a few. But I'll tell you, none uh, at all were quite like the Empire State Building. As an engineer, uh, I am hoping to impart a unique perspective about working on such uh, an iconic lighting project. 
for many reasons, I think ESB is really a fantastic lighting retrofit case study, uh, which it has some good takeaways for uh, everyone on the call, uh, especially for future projects. So as one can imagine, delivering a project like ESB requires overcoming a number of challenges. Today, we're gonna to focus on just a couple of them. We're gonna talk a little bit about history, a couple of planning challenges, um, some execution challenges, and then just like Gavin did, we'll talk about the results. So Empire State Building, quick overview of the history. Uh, you get a nice picture here of the Empire State Building during construction. Um, one of the things that I always found shocking uh, when worrying about the Empire State Building, gosh knows how long ago, uh, was that it was constructed in a year and 45 days, which is pretty amazing. Construction started in uh, 1930, mid-March, finished in uh, early May 1931 in classic Art Deco style. Um, the peak labor force while it was being constructed was over 3,000, uh, and the framework rose at an amazing four and a half stories per week. So the, the steel uh, is rumored to have still been warm when it was being installed. By the end, uh, an estimated 7 million man hours went into the construction of this building, which is pretty crazy. Uh, it was selected by the American Society of Civil Engineers as one of the seven greatest engineering achievements in American history. It is a national landmark here in the US and obviously uh, a symbol of uh, New York City. You can see some of the uh, amazing stats here on the slide. So a bit more uh, about Empire State Building. Uh, this focused more on its size. Uh, ESB is a massive signature on the uh, New York City skyline for all those who haven't seen it. Um, its visibility is estimated at over 65 miles, has its own zip code. It was the tallest office building in the world for more than 40 years. Now, the 86th floor observatory, which is your standard observatory uh, where most of the pictures you'll see are from, is at about a thousand feet. Uh, they have a second observatory uh, if you're uh, lucky enough and patient enough to stand in line uh, to get up to at the 102nd floor, which is another 200 feet above, uh, 1,250 feet. Now, uh, many may not know this, but the Empire State Building actually has two more uh, levels inside the building, 103 and 104. 103 is primarily a mechanical floor with access to a small parapet. And I'll tell you, uh, one does not go out on that parapet if they're afraid of heights. Um, I happen to love heights, and this was uh, probably one of the best experiences of my career. The level 104 is basically the inside of the base of the antenna tower, which uh, was installed in 1950 for the 20th anniversary of the building. Um, houses all sorts of broadcast antenna. Uh, and um, that tower brings the height of the building to over 1,400 feet. Quick bit on the lighting history. Uh, the takeaways here, uh, ESB has been at the forefront of exterior lighting since the 1930s. You can see President Hoover pushed the button uh, to turn it on. Uh, really, truly though, the lighting of the exterior facade didn't start until 1956 when there were some beacon lights that were installed. The, Traditional lighting system, as we'll discuss it, was installed in the late 70s. And since then, uh, while that was a fantastic system, clearly it, it set the you know, ESB as uh, a, a major icon and, and a nighttime landmark uh, for the world. Um, ESB did explore, they, they uh, tested the water, so to speak, with other lighting technologies. Uh, a number of bidders have attempted to replace this lighting system, but they failed. Interestingly enough, Philips and Color Kinetics as separate companies fought for the honor of lighting ESB back in 2007. Now, of course, 2012, uh, the tower lights were replaced with dynamic color changing uh, and white LED lights uh, because the technology finally reached a point where the new system uh, could surpass all the facets of the old existing system. Now, uh, in terms of the objectives, for the job, which play into the challenges, of course. Um, replace all outdoor uh, and indoor fixtures and, you know, facade lighting. This would be the 1,000-watt metal halides uh, for the facades 
the fluorescent uh, linear fixtures for the mast and the high pressure sodium luminaris. We'll talk about those locations in just a second. ESB uh, is actually well known at this point for modernization and the push towards energy efficiency. So clearly that was a target. Cost savings uh, and now maintaining the iconic appearance was a particularly important criteria. Uh, in essence, the requirement was that the new lighting should not diminish the integrity of the existing look in any way. As one can imagine, uh, when completely changing technologies, that's actually fairly difficult. So moving on to the lighting zones, the most notorious of the lighting zones is down there at level 72, which you can see here on the picture on the left. Uh, very short setback, long distance throw, um, and something that uh, had sort of become the, the signature uh, lighting element. I guess it depends on who you ask. Uh, level 81, another uh, another limestone facade, just like 72. The uh, the bands there, level CC and level BB, those are both uh, what we call the horizontal bands. The mooring mast, which has uh, direct view fluorescence in these, the old system, as well as the fins were part of the, the mooring mast construction um, and the halo at the top. Now, the halo was only ever used after 2 a.m., but was considered part of the lighting system. So some challenges uh, that faced us in replacing this existing system. The 1,000-watt metal halides, which you can see on the left there, uh, Gavin mentioned some uh, that he had to replace at Miami Tower. You can see on the, the very narrow, shallow setback here on 72. 1,000-watt uh, metal halides are well over 100,000 lumens each, uh, quite punchy. Um, now, LEDs have a particular advantage when it comes to competing against metal halides like these uh, that are using colored gels, uh, in reference to what Gavin was talking about. Uh, you may see less than 5,000 lumens on a fixture like this when it's on a color like blue. Uh, the RGB fixture, uh, the LED fixture on the other hand, may be as low as 100 watts for the same level of blue output, which is pretty crazy. Uh, you can now, if you turn your attention to the picture at the bottom right, this is a picture looking up the mooring mast. You can see the banks of uh, eight foot T12 fluorescent fixtures. Uh, each fixture would have five lamps, a yellow, a red, a white, a green, and a blue which uh, they would use to mix the colors. Now, T, uh, T12 fluorescent direct view is amazingly bright, and it's also quite energy efficient. So uh, just considering the challenge of making the entire installation uh, more energy efficient uh, than the previous one, one has to consider that T12s are actually quite efficient. Um, against both technologies, LED has some advantages, but it also has some, some major I would call them obstacles to overcome. Uh, probably uh, many on the call are familiar with some of them. The most uh, challenging for us at this application was the white. Uh, LED white is, in my experience, is particularly for iconic buildings like this, is where the challenge lies. So we're going to talk a bit about the famous white here. You can see uh, a great shot uh, in the picture on the left. Um, so perhaps you know the greatest challenge was uh, you know, the iconic white, we would call this ESB white. Um, from the beginning of our involvement, it was clear that the lighting would not be replaced until the brightness, quality, uh, and character of the white light could be replicated. Um, it's not really a surprise coming from a retrofit of this profile. You know, once you've had a particular look for so long, you, at a minimum, want to meet it. Uh, obviously, the challenge for us was to both meet and exceed. Um, you know, ESB pioneered the use of color on the skyline, but uh, if you look at the calendar, they, uh, they have white the majority of the time. The root of this challenge, uh, of course, is that the human eye is uh, very good at distinguishing the differences in white lights. The light um, is also, you know, for a particular building, is truly specific to that application. So this includes the, the, the orientation of the fixtures, the character of the facade, viewing locations, et cetera. Uh, so in order to achieve what we knew would have to be um, a, a very good replication of ESB's white, uh, we did several things. We studied three uh, characteristics. We first studied the hue, color, or 
CCT, if you want to call it. Um, although CCT uh, defined uh, the, the uh, paralleling the black body curve, we're also looking at uh, how green or how blue the light would be above and below. So while the facade was illuminated with nominal 4,000 K metal halide lamps, um, there were many factors that impacted uh, the perceived color of the white, including the fact that these metal halide lamps, as they uh, uh, you know went throughout the course of their life, would change uh, correlated color temperature and would skew very dramatically uh, above or below the black body curve. Um, so what we did was we measured all the existing fixture locations, uh, both from the fixtures and the facade, which provided uh, uh, us a breakdown of the many, many facets that sort of combine, that aggregate to form this classic look. Um, for what it's worth, we measured the values as low as 2,500K and as high as 5,200K, which remember, these are nominal 4,000K lands. So at the end of the day, we settled on an average of 3,700K, um, although obviously uh, an aggregate. The brightness was an important metric. Uh, we calibrated, I uh, used calibrated luminance meters and GPS devices. Uh, to measure uh, different points on the facade to ensure that we could uh, achieve that level of brightness. Um, we measured over 100 candela per meter squared nits, in other words, uh, at the base of the parapets, which is, when you're talking about video screens, it's not all that bright, but when you're talking about uh, indirect wash applications, it's extremely bright. Uh, we used uh, then AGI32 and 3ds Max, which are flowmetric rendering programs, uh, to confirm that we were in the ballpark of that brightness. Um, and then coverage is the third part of this. Uh, you know, the metal halides create this extremely uniform uh, coverage horizontally and this wonderful uh, gradient going from top to bottom, uh, which was, uh, we decided, critical to match, not just for the light, um, but uh, certainly in pursuing light. So in addition to this, uh, you know, we took photographs and um, created our own set of as-builts. Um, and I think most importantly, we understood the inherent limitations of RGB LED systems. Um, the CRI uh, limitation with RGB really dictates that you use white chips. So uh, that's what we did. If you can see here, here are the products that we used. Uh, the high intensity large flood, uh, you can see that we've used both uh, RGB and white LEDs. Uh, same with the linear wash fixtures, which were used both direct view uh, and indirect view, which we'll talk about just a bit. Um, the medium flood, uh, we did not use white LEDs, but these were used only direct view uh, without any sort of diffusion. Um, the eye is not quite as good at distinguishing lights uh, in that way, so uh, we didn't have to use double fixtures there. Now, uh, in terms of how we accomplish the lighting look, this chart pretty much says it all. You can see that uh, we used several different beam angles for the large floods, um, which also incorporated several different aiming points. And we also used the linear wash fixtures. Uh, this particular section is from 72. You can see the uh, very shallow setback there and the extremely high throw distance. Um, the Indiana limestone that covers the facade, while beautiful, uh, it pretty much eats light for breakfast. Um, and you know, while it's great for diffusing light, uh, it does it does tend to darken uh, quite a bit. So an uh, a tremendous amount of light is required uh, in order to achieve the the nit targets that we measured. Um, now we calculated uh, specific aim points uh, to ensure that uh, you know we avoided windows and that we hit the parts that we needed to hit in order to make the look as uniform as possible. Now, as you can see, I mentioned earlier, the linear wash fixtures were used. Uh, these were used to emulate the metal halide spill that you get from uh, the traditional fixtures, uh, the fill light, so to speak, at the base of the parapet. Um, and this was specifically to preserve the integrity of the look, as we talked about a bit ago. Here's a quick look at the 81st floor. Uh, you can tell with the deeper setback, we had uh, to use fewer spread lens. Now, we still had to specifically aim each fixture, um, but uh, as you can see, it's a little bit, it's a little bit easier. Now, but this section does sort of belie the, the, true, the true environment up there. Uh, over the course of time, the Empire State Building has added uh, numerous uh, antenna, um, 
uh, air conditioning units and all sorts of other stuff. So uh, on on this floor in particular, uh, where the fixtures were positioned horizontally uh, made a big difference on the actual impact. These aim points uh, over the course of the installation were painstakingly achieved. So uh, here we have a nice couple of images of the 72nd floor facade after the uh, new LED lighting system installed. You can see uh, the drastic changes in aim points uh, as you look along the, um, the image at the left. Uh, you can also see how tightly the fixtures had to be packed in. Uh, this is testament to the power of the thousand watt metal halides. Uh, while certainly, um, you know, more analog in terms of uh, controllability uh, um, and just, I guess, in terms of an analogy, uh, they are super powerful. And in terms of actually getting light on the building, I took a lot of fixtures to replace. Uh, you might also notice in this picture on the left, the mounting plates. Uh, these mounting plates are made entirely of steel. Um, since these parapets uh, also double as roofs for the floor below, this is true of 72 and 81, um, attaching light fixtures to the parapets was not an option, particularly because in the original design concept back in the, 19, the late 1920s, uh, there was, I would imagine, no foresight in terms of lighting. Certainly, they didn't anticipate these, uh, these many LED fixtures being put up there. Um, now, code requirements have significantly changed since the late 70s, and so uh, in order to meet code, uh, the fixtures had to be ballasted. So what you're looking at is roughly 500 pounds of steel per fixture, which equated to uh, over 60 tons worth of steel for uh, the two facades, 72 and 81. So uh, for, those, for those on the call, beware of changes in code. Uh, at the bottom right, you can see an image at night. What's interesting about this image, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, is that the red LEDs are on, but you can also see that the white LEDs are on. Um, in the pre-launch phase, we were required to keep the building lit in standard colors. Uh, this is actually the standard red color. It's not some not some other color that, that ESB had used. In fact, ESB only had uh, eight colors. If you count white, they had nine. So red was one of them. And the reason you see the white LEDs on here is because the metal halides uh, in order to do red, you have to put a uh, large plastic disc on them. And in order to keep that plastic disc from melting uh, all of the fixture, you have to provide a hole in the middle for the heat to escape. That, of course, lets white light out. And so the actual look of the building was not a purely saturated red. Uh, and so in order to match that, we had to turn on the white LEDs. Interesting. Um, this red, for what it's worth, is operating in about 10% intensity. If that gives you any idea of uh, the, the power of the LED system on saturated colors. So here we are on the mooring mast, uh, a little bit about this install. Um, now, there were no ballasting requirements here, uh, but the combined 13 stories between the mooring mast and the horizontal bands made for a tremendously difficult install, uh, particularly due to access. Uh, the mooring mast in particular, as you can see the image on the right, required high steel work, um, which uh, is, is quite slow uh, in terms of um, meeting project deadlines. That's, that's quite, quite important. So we want to talk a little bit about mock-ups here. The two images uh, that you see here are from uh, what I would call preliminary mock-ups. These were done um, these were done sort of covertly, uh, not uh, outside of public view. They were done really more for proof of concept for ourselves. And I would say that in terms of in terms of uh, executing an iconic project like this, it's extremely important to uh, measure uh, the new technology versus the old technology and truly prove the concept. You can do all the measurements that you want. Uh, you can do all the AGI or 3DS Max renderings um, to your heart's content. But until you put the light up on the building, and I'll tell you this, we learned this time and time again at the Empire State Building, uh, you don't know the true impact of the new lighting uh, until you've compared it to the old lighting. Um, and this, this also is true as we move on to larger mock-ups, which you can see a couple images of here. Uh, one of the staggering things is that even when you, even when one has done uh, 
preliminary mock-ups where it's say two LED fixtures versus one metal halide fixture. The aggregate effect of the metal halide fixtures versus the aggregate of the LED fixtures is just not known until uh, you can put them all on the building. So I would emphasize the importance uh, in this case whether it's in the proof of concept phase, the design phase, the selling phase, of actually putting together uh, larger scale mock-ups, though they take more time um, and can be more costly uh, and certainly have much greater challenges, without a doubt, totally worth it. So larger mock-ups for the Empire State Building um, were truly what I would call performances. And from this point forward, actually, when you're considering our, our, our work on the building, everything was a performance. Um, for the mock-ups in particular, uh, the one on the picture on the left here is from May. You can see that um, all six zones uh, are lit up. Actually, it's pretty difficult in the picture to see that there are fixtures lit up in the mass, but they're there. Uh, you can see the purple all the way up on the level 103, the little dot up at the top there, all the way down to 72. Uh, there's clearly some lighting going on there. Uh, you can imagine that in the middle of New York City, this is quite the event, uh, so one has to make sure that it goes off well. Uh, also, this mock was not just for our purposes. This was, uh, in this case, a, a effectively a sign-off mock-up with the client. And so that uh, increased the performance uh, value of the mock-up tremendously. Um, without a network infrastructure in place, because the installation hadn't started yet, this became a very unique challenge in order to execute this kind of mock-up. Uh, we had to uh, establish a wireless bridge from the viewing location, which is where the picture is taken from for what it's worth. And we also employed backup personnel at each, uh, each lighting location, uh, handheld radios, uh, amazing, amazing coordination. And I'll tell you, uh, I've not really seen anything like it. Um, although I would imagine that for truly iconic projects, this sort of, this sort of effort is, is, you know, would be required. Um, so, also on larger mock-ups, as you can see in the bottom right, uh, there is the issue of if I'm going to mock up a larger area, what do I do with the existing fixtures? Uh, in the case of this May mock-up, we had to do both. Uh, we had to uh, scatter fixtures around uh, the new LED lighting fixtures around existing fixtures. Um, but for the main facade on 72, uh, because there's so little space on that parapet, we actually had to have uh, ESB's electricians rip out the fixtures, the existing fixtures, and put in our fixtures and replace them the next day, which if you can imagine, um, given that the lighting has been up there for you know literally three decades, uh, there's quite a bit of risk involved in that. Why? Because the next night, the lights have to come on. Uh, and that's just the performance nature of doing a job like this. Now, I would say one of the single greatest challenges over the course of the installation was the keep it lit requirement. The keep it lit requirement mandated that every night during the installation process, the building had to be lit as if the existing lighting system had never been removed. So obviously, in addition to keeping the building lit, uh, the new lights had to match the old lights, uh, both in profile, and by this I mean light distribution, and also color and hue. This included uh, startup and fade in time. Uh, for any of those familiar with metal halides, uh, when they strike, when they when they get turned on, they're quite dim and they're quite green uh, or, or an odd number of different colors. And it takes them somewhere on the order of 10, 15 minutes um, to reach full intensity. They'll reach a reasonable intensity in like one to two minutes. Um, but obviously, when you have an LED system, boom, lights come on, they're full brightness. Uh, you don't want to have that if you're trying to disguise what you're doing. Uh, and so we had to build in fade times to the fixtures that were uh, you know, installed. In accordance with this requirement, over the entire course of the installation, I'm happy to say not a single part of the building ever went dark. Uh, it's actually still kind of amazing to me. Um, we had uh, part of the, a number of people in the group checking social media, uh, looking at newspapers, looking at uh, news reports you know, on TV. And not once did we see that anybody noticed the installation was going on. Um, and that's, uh, that's re really quite an achievement, especially since everybody's always watching ESB. It's really, it's really quite amazing. Um, now, in order to do this, we prepared temporary infrastructure uh, to support the 
the operation of both existing and new product. That's quite a challenge and it's quite an expense, um, but it had to be done. Also, and this is a really good takeaway for large iconic projects like this, Winbox tested configured, tagged, and prepared fixtures at a location offsite. And I would say, you know, anything that can be done in terms of preparation is, is a really good idea. Uh, we then periodically delivered sufficient fixture quantities for upcoming installation targets. And um, uh, each day we would demo and remove existing fixtures and then also install an equivalent number of LED fixtures. If I had to guess, that's probably on the average of 10 to 15 LED fixtures per day. Uh, the new fixtures were oftentimes installed in full temporary power data and mounting systems. And then the permanent infrastructure uh, was uh, put in place only after entire sections were completed. Here's a, a great series of pictures that I feel like demonstrates uh, the challenge of, of keeping it lit. Now, overall, I'd say that we, we were very successful in matching colors while the installation was going on. Uh, a key factor in that success was preparing uh, the RGB or RGBW values that we needed to use in order to match the colors. Uh, we did this through deliberate color match testing, and that's, that's not all that hard. Um, but uh, light from one fixture to another does not necessarily 100% um, uh, represent what the larger uh, aggregate is going to be. So, uh, in other words, um, if you look at one fixture, the color you get from that is not necessarily going to match uh, all the uh, all the fixtures combined. We talked about this a little bit with light, but it's also true of color. Um, for some trickier colors, uh, the match was not always instant. We didn't we didn't nail it 100%. Um, probably because of the aggregating factor, uh, which I'll call it. Um, if you look at these images on the left, this is a zoomed out view of um, the image in the center. So the image in the center is what uh, the image on the left hand side looked like. You just can't see it because you're a ways away and uh, the camera, camera didn't really do a good job of capturing it. However, it does represent what was visible from the street. Um, but once we once we used a telephoto lens and zoomed in on it, as you can see in the center, the yellows were a little different. And so uh, we then dialed them in. Uh, you can see the image on the right, where they're much more closely matched, um, certainly beyond uh, what one can tell. Anyway, uh, this uh, this had to be done about 30 times throughout the installation um, because for each color, for each lighting zone, uh, we had to make sure that we had the colors right. So another couple things that we had to do just real quickly uh, in order to ensure that the building never went dark, um, we had to make sure that our system was fully operational, which uh, involved uh, querying devices daily uh, and also having uh, redundant systems in order to um, fail over if a controller uh, had a problem for one reason or another. All right, talking about um, uh, some building obstacles, some other challenges. Uh, in addition to keeping the, bit, uh, the building lit every night, uh, we had to keep the installation's visibility impact to an absolute minimum. Uh, ESP is premier tourist destination. Uh, the, the project, as I've alluded to, is a closely guarded secret. I shouldn't say that the project itself was, but the progress of the project was a closely guarded secret. That's probably a better way to put it. Uh, ESP has tremendous broadcast operations, and they're fully integrated uh, in the uh, buildings daily operations. Uh, and like any other office building, the Empire State Building is full of active businesses. Um, so those guidelines were imposed on all project crews uh, to ensure that we were sensitive to uh, all those people. Um, here are some examples. No deliveries to the building allowed during normal business hours. We're talking late, um, like, you know, 4 or 5 a.m. Um, no equipment was allowed through observation spaces outside a brief window. And in this case, we're talking about one or two hours in the middle of the night. Uh, on top of these requirements, we're not the only project team working in the building. Empire State Building is going through a number of amazing, um, uh, I guess, probably the best term for them, upgrades, modernization efforts, et cetera. Uh, and so there are a lot of people working there every day. So in order to maximize opportunities, we spent nights moving equipment around, as I mentioned. Um, we carefully scheduled uh, trips on freight elevators um, to keep the number of trips at a minimum. Uh, like I said, though, key key point: we pre-assembled equipment offsite, and we work closely with uh, building management and the ESB staff to coordinate. Um, of course, you can't always predict things like weather, um, 
uh, at 100 floors up, you have a bit of a microclimate. Uh, we we tracked the weather as best we could, but even with tracking the weather, you can't necessarily tell whether the thunderstorm is going to hit at 3 p.m. after the electricians have gone home or hit at 11 a.m. when it's really going to screw things up. Um, when you have 10 existing metal halides ripped out and no uh, new fixtures installed. So the most important thing I can say as far as takeaway is uh, we maintained a parallel, a parallel execution path. Um, which meant, you know, if the weather didn't cooperate on a particular day, um, we switched to our indoor plan for the day. Say, for example, working on the network. Now, real quick, I'm going to blow through uh, some stuff on the results here. Um, I'll tell you, uh, this is this is a picture from the launch event. Um, pretty much says it all. Uh, the standard marketing statistics here: uh, over 1,200 state-of-the-art new fixtures. Um, enhanced quality of light. I wouldn't limit it to white light. Certainly, saturated colors and stuff are really amazing. Um, over 16 million colors. I mean, that's that's humans really can see a thousand or less, but um, this is just uh, eight the control of three channels uh, gets you 16.7 million. Um, a dynamic color changing. Uh, we've got fantastic control system um, and monitoring to go with it. Now, the first time we got to see it like this, this is a the picture on the left is. Um, from the first night that we turned it on, we actually had a covert mock-up at 4 a.m. And I'll tell you, after years of planning um, and months of executing this project, even I was blown away. Um, you know, you put so much time into analyzing what something's going to look like, uh, and in this case, it, it truly floored me. Um, I, the low cloud deck, you know, it, it played into it. It had this fantastic, you know, illumination off the clouds. It was really amazing. Um, I would point out in this picture, you can see the fins lit up. The fins uh, had been lit before, but then the lights had been taken away to make uh, to make room for uh, antennas. I think, regardless, they were gone um, for the last couple of decades. And then um, uh, lit up like this, it really changed the character of the building at night in a very positive way. I think, uh, especially since it sort of highlights uh, some of the major Art Deco elements that, that the building has. Uh, the saturation was overwhelming, uh, really fantastic. And I'll tell you, um, we did one more of these uh, mock-ups, and we would have done even more, but um, we were caught by a morning newscaster uh, from a local news station who, um, you know, all the these stations all have cameras trained on ESB all the time. Um, but the, 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 the news person said basically uh, right on air. Um, and, you know, in just a moment, we'll, uh, you know, go back and show you a video of a beautiful light show on ESB that we just captured. Um, they never did show any videos, but it was um, it was quite the it was quite the event. Um, and uh, given the uh, secrecy surrounding the launch event, um, we we shut it down. And in order to actually achieve the launch event, it was critical uh, that we developed a visualization system in order to predict what things were going to look like. And that was um, that was super important for uh, those who worked on uh, creating that the successful launch event. Um, a couple a couple things about the launch events. Uh, this was sort of a soft launch. The uh, election coverage uh, via CNN. Um, we had a uh, a connection between CNN's uh, Midtown control room and the Empire State Building. Uh, really, really kind of an interesting application. And then of course uh, ESB's first ever LED Tower light show, um, November 26th. Uh, the the launch event. Really, kind of amazing, uh, amazing event. Got to watch it live. It was, it was really special. Um, so, uh, I believe I'm going to turn it back over to Nathan now, uh, who, in follow up, will provide uh, a link to the launch video. Yes, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Justin, for that very interesting presentation. Um, the link for the video will be provided in the post webinar mail that everyone who registered and attended will receive. Um, right now, we're going to go to Gavin and Justin, and they're going to answer some of the questions posted below in the Q and A box. Guys, I'm going to hand it over to you. Hi, yeah, this is Gavin. Um, I've got a question from uh, a ten, I think it's pronounced, um, on what would be annual savings in energy. Um, that was actually um, over 
thousand kilowatt hours a year. Um, the original system was running at around 879 thousand kilowatt hours and we reduced that by 91 percent so we're down to around 71 thousand kilowatt hours so that adds up to around about ninety thousand dollars a year in saving as of today um obviously with energy going up that's going to go up as well and increase the savings um uh to to robin miller uh, i was asking for fixtures on the side of the building um were they linear um only the uh the top floor the 45th floor with linear fixtures everything else was the large high power wash fixture um whether they were on the poles whether they were on the setbacks whatever that was all the same fixture the only one that was was different uh, was on the uh on the crown on the top of the building um back to tin again um what was the total labor materials and cost for putting that there. Uh, to be fair to everybody, I would probably say it was north of one and a half million and slightly south of two million, if that's uh, fair to do. <laughs> and um, back to, uh, to to Chris, um was asking for driver failures. Um, part of choosing the fix that we did is because we'd also use them in other Pretty hostile environment. Um, yes, Miami is very hot, uh, even at night time. We recorded some temperatures of over 90 degrees at 12 o'clock at night, which is what, 31 degrees Celsius. Um, so at 12, 1 o'clock at night, it, it is very warm. Um, but due to heat failure, now we've not lost anything at all. Um, we have lost a couple of fixtures due to a lightning strike, um, but they were very well protected, and it was only two fixtures that were actually. Uh, so it's a pretty direct hit. So, um, you know, we were, the fixtures itself were very solid. Um, we haven't lost any drivers. We haven't lost anything else to, to heat or to weather. I mean, the other thing is we do get a hell of a lot of rain down here um, and torrential rain. So it's almost uh, like putting them through a car wash pretty much every day during the summer. And we haven't experienced any problems due to, uh, to rain either. And uh, I think that's it. I think the question's probably for Justin, yeah, on the uh, colour Yeah, Gavin, yeah, I'll take a couple questions. Um, so one of the questions was how long did the entire installation take? From contract to launch, it was 11 months. But from contract to completion, it was really more like seven and a half or eight months. Um, the, the fun part about that is that prior to the launch event, and, and really prior to the, the soft launch event, I guess I'd say, um, in early November, uh, most of New York or most of everybody didn't know uh, that the LED installation had actually been completed. Um, so to answer your question, the installation took about seven and a half months, um, which for a project of this size is, is really quite, really quite crazy. Uh, the programming for the uh, the second question was how long did the programming for the opening event take? The programming for the opening event uh, was was really quite a feat in and of itself. Uh, we probably worked um, in conjunction with the lighting designer uh, Mark Berkman for about a month on infrastructure and planning. Although when it comes down to the actual cues that were used. Uh, the programming of those probably didn't take much more than a week, week and a half. Um, <clears throat> so a couple other questions. How did you manage the programming when it is a dynamic effect and managing the 360 degrees around the building? Uh, this, you know, perhaps I didn't spend quite enough time on it. Uh, this is truly the, um, the power of, of being able to visualize. There are standard visualization softwares out there that can, can provide some of this capability. One of the things that we have to remember is that as part of an intrinsic part of the LED system is that uh, it operates off of um, standard digital signals. In this case, our system uses uh, standard Ethernet switches and Ethernet backbones. And so that sort of information is pretty easy, but not, maybe easy isn't the right term, but 
um, it's relatively straightforward on a conceptual level to turn into a visualization of uh, what should be going on. Um, so at the root of it, in order to visualize this 360 degrees around the building, we used a separate, a completely separate server control system in order to generate fake data so that it could be displayed uh, in real time in concert with um, whatever real data was going to be set. And then uh, final question, um, <clears throat> how was the data running on such a large installation planned and programmed? Um, yeah, you know, I certainly could have spent some time on this as well. Uh, the network uh, was a challenge in and of itself. The <clears throat> one of the biggest issues is, uh, you know, location, location, location. Um, you want access to vital system elements whenever you're doing an installation like this. And the best place for the control system uh, for the Empire State Building uh, was in where they keep the rest of their head end servers, which is much lower on the building, um, down on the you know on the, the first second floor area. Now, of course, where all the lights are is up on the 72nd floor, the 81st floor, the 90th floor, uh, and all the way up at 103rd floor. So, um, unlike the mock-up where we where we use point-to-point -point wireless from an adjacent building, um, one actually does have to run or use structured cable in between those different zones. Um, in order to run long lengths, uh, as I'm sure many are familiar, uh, one is well advised to use fiber optic cable. Uh, it's, it's quite a bit less expensive and it's quite much more well known at this point than it used to be. Um, I, I, in, in my experience, I see um, installations shy away from fiber optic and I'll tell you it was one of the keys in this installation to ensuring that um, connectivity was sound, solid, and fast. Um, but another part of this really is, uh, as long as you abide by run length limitations of, of the copper cable, when you're not using fiber, um, the communication is quite quick, so long as you keep the switch latency low. Uh, so we just made sure that we were not uh, hopping from switch to switch to switch in a serial fashion. And, um, you know, to be quite honest, the the, the data rates were, were, from the moment we flipped it on, were, were really, really good. Now, one of the purposes for those crazy, uh, uh, you know, covert 4 a.m. mock-ups was specifically to test out the integrity of the network. This question really points at um, what was a core concern for us when considering a launch event uh, of the magnitude that, that ESD put on. And, and so uh, that testing was, was vital. And, um, you can do all sorts of simulations. In fact, we we ran the building uh, during the day quite a bit when nobody you know nobody can see the lights during the day. Um, but um, you know you never really know until you see the lights respond. And uh, I would say that the trick the trick in this case was keeping the network simple and using the right uh, you know cabling methods. Okay, thank you, Justin and Gavin. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of the presentation. We'd like to thank you for attending and look forward to next month's presentation on How Designers Find Inspiration by Sharon Martin and Martin Dutton. For more information, we're going to be sending out a post-webinar email to everyone that attended and registered with a link to the recording of this webinar to be viewed at your leisure, and a link to our LinkedIn community if you have more questions for Justin or Gavin, and a Twitter link in case you have any Twitter questions for them. Thank you for attending, and have a nice day.